So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, December the 24th. That's right. It's Christmas Eve and I'm here with you and I'm so glad that you're here with me right now. This is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 139. And this is the way to be. So these are questions that were submitted over the past week and I'm glad that you're here. It's also a podcast on Podbean, the way to be. And if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, Please look down in the video description below and you'll see all the topics covered. And we got some cool stuff and watch at the very end for the fluff section because I got stuff to talk about. So we're going to jump right into it with Liz Michaels question. First year with my bees and do you have a video that will tell me if my bees are doing okay without opening the boxes? That's actually something that uh, is a really good skill to have but I do not have a video that explains evaluating bees without opening the boxes, although I do frequently talk about how important it is to look at the landing board, to look at the ground in front of the hive, and to see behavior around the hives. And that's because we can learn a lot before we ever open it up. For example, you would know right away if the hive's defensive or not. And I talk frequently about looking for pollen during periods of a nectar availability. So when the nectar flow is on, the flowers are producing nectar. Some people call this the honey flow. So it's the same thing, but that's when you'll see a bunch of pollen zipping in through the door. So 10 or more per minute, things like that. There is a book that I was unable to find. And I believe the author focuses almost exclusively on not getting into the hives and looking instead at landing boards and determining what's going on with your hives. And for me here in the Northeastern United States, I can't really endorse 100% just looking at landing boards and then only opening the hives, for example, uh, the way Dr. Leo suggests it twice a year. So in the spring and then in the fall to harvest honey, where for me, there are a lot of colonies that I would lose. For example, if I didn't know that they were queenless or if I didn't know that they had some disease or that they're overwhelmed with varroa destructor mites and might require some intervention there. So looking at the landing boards is fun and it's something that you do as often as you like because you're not bothering the bees. Bees don't care unless you sit directly in front of their entrance. It's a favorite pastime of my grandsons. They all have their own bee suits. They like being able to sit right next to a honeybee landing board and they're my early warning mechanism by coming over to grandfather. I think that colony is about to swarm, and I never dismiss what they have to say, even though they are now both six years old. I go over and check it out, and you would be amazed at how often they're pretty accurate that something is different. Something is going on with that hive that requires attention. But there is a book, and I invite other viewers that are looking at this right now, if you know the title of the book, observations, landing board observations, or something like that, please put the link in the comment section below. And also, when people are putting in links, sometimes you'll find your comment disappears. And that's because any link to another site or another video or something like that is automatically held. So don't think that, it, that you're blocked somehow because that's not what's going on. But there's a lot that can be learned from looking at the landing boards, and it's a skill set. And you'll begin to notice uh, right away when you're at a hive and the colony is not doing well for one reason or another. And I also highly recommend that you get out there as early in the day as you can. So prior to sunrise, if you can do it, because often there are dead bees on the landing board, for example, drones being tossed out pretty normal this time of year. And uh, you get to see what's going on before things warm up and the bees could clean up the evidence and then you wouldn't necessarily know what's going on. You might look for dead bees right in front of the hive, but if you've got good undertaker bees, they're grabbing the dead bees and flying them away. Healthy colonies don't dump all their dead directly in front of their hive. That's why when you see a pile of dead bees in front of your hive, it could be a problem. It could be a problem that you need to check out. So question number two comes from Keith Spillman. 
Hi Fred, hearing lots of reports about bees going after the Hive Alive Fondant emergency food as soon as it is placed in the hive. And this makes me wonder if we've managed to somehow make our emergency food tastier for girls than their regular food. I can't argue about that. And the Hive Alive thing going to mention it again because you're going to see just about every YouTuber that keeps bees right now, they're, they're using this this year on some level. For me, 50% of my colonies have it on. It's Hive Alive. That's the name of the company. These are two pound, four ounce fondant packs. I like them because I can put them on the inner cover, which is insulated for most of my hives this year. And then I can see right there how much of the emergency ration, which is what it's supposed to be, as Keith says here, it's for emergency purposes. Get out of there. You still have honey. You still have pollen stored in your frames. That's what you should be using. You shouldn't be up in the candy store right now, but that's what the bees are doing, although it's not the same for every colony that I have. Some of them have only barely started to chew holes in it. Others have a good, like the most consumption, I would say is 20% of the patties so far. And that's even with the large colonies, so they still have resources down below. Does this mean that they could be abandoning their resources like honey and pollen, which they need to produce brood in winter and to keep themselves warm? We would like them to use their stored honey. And when we put food on top, and for me it's dry sugar or right now this fondant. Fondant isn't something that I was ever comfortable making myself. I know that there are people that do it, and in my last video... I put a link to Vino Farms uh, fondant making demonstration because he had some pretty accurate descriptions and he demonstrated all the temperature parameters and everything. So I was never comfortable making my own fondant. So I always put dry sugar on as an emergency feed and the bees use it a lot. Plus it's a way for them to consume and utilize hive interior moisture. So the water that condenses on the interior sides of your hives in the wintertime gets lapped up by the bees and they have to use that to process the dry sugar. They also have to use it to process honey that's stored. So, one of the other, so, but the other thing is, this is our first winter with fondant for me, with the Hive Alive. Maybe they have such a fantastic formula that the bees are just going after it right away. But any consumption of the fondant or their honey, and of course they're going to use pollen too for the brood that they have. Uh, we hope that we don't migrate the cluster up underneath the inner cover just so that they can all be in close contact with this fondant. I don't really see evidence of that here uh, that they're using only that. I think they're using that in addition to the stored honey that they have. So those of you with uh, broodminder scales and things like that on your hives, you'll know better the overall weight because you only added two pounds and four ounces with the fondant so we're going to lose weight during winter time, just like hibernating bears that lose weight through winter because their resources are stored through their fats and everything else. So for the beehive, the fat of the bear, the fat of the superorganism is, of course, the honey stores and the pollen that they store and then the emergency ration that we have just in case they use those things up. But if they've migrated up underneath the inner cover and left a bunch of honey stores down below, and they may have abandoned good resources. And that's why we need to be ready to have another packet to go right on there. So my recommendation would be that if you're seeing your Hive Alive fondant packet or any fondant that you have, when they've used 70 or 80% of it, that's when I think I would replace it. I wouldn't wait for them to consume every last little corner every little bit of it because that's the other thing that we're waiting to see keep in mind it's our first year with it another question that i get about that is hey can those bees really get into all the little corners and everything else well i hope they do and uh, that's something i want to see but of course we're going to let them you know as they go into spring i want to see that the fond is used up because when the weather's warm i'm not worried about them then being locked up near the top so it's only when we have the really cold below 60s, uh, and by the way, I forgot to mention today what the temperature is, unseasonably warm, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's 10 degrees Celsius. So the bees were flying today, Christmas Eve. That is rare. 
But anyway, this is the first year, so we're going to see how they handle it. Uh, they won't starve out over that as long as we keep the fondant coming. So once you start feeding any supplement, you need to continue feeding it. I would say that the dry sugar, uh, which I'm giving the other hives in the rapid round style feeders, this is a smaller one than I use, but it's the same design. Uh, we have four pounds of sugar on each hive, and they're like, um, they, they tend to work it in groups, so there's just little dish outs in the sugar. So the sugar looks like it's going to last the rest of the winter, and they are using that too. Good sign because we know if they're eating sugar, if they're eating fondant, we don't know that they're doing that instead of their honey stores. They might be eating it in addition to because every bee in the hive is not up there in those feeders. Uh, but they are consuming it, and that tells us that a hive that's doing, that's consuming and metabolizing resources is still alive and they're still going. So it's going to be interesting to see kind of what spring reveals to us about how well that worked. And the reason I did 50% with my usual just sugar, dry sugar, uh, and then, of course, the fondant for the other 50%. I want to see, did that really impact the numbers coming into spring? Did one or the other really boost the bees? And what else am I going to look at, which requires a microscope, by the way? Can you guess? We're going to look at the nosema load. And that's because nosema tends to be concentrated in the bees in early spring. So that's when we can scoop out bees. And we can even test the dead bees, by the way. So when you're using your scraper like this or whichever one you're using and you reach in the back and you're scooping out those dead bees something to do in the winter time you set up as i do you just set up your microscope on the kitchen table because you have that nice big window there the morning sun comes through and now we can pull off their abdomens and crush all their bee guts uh, these are the dead bees that we get and we can see what the nosema spore load is so, and if you don't know how to do that, look it up. There are video demonstrations on how to do it. Otherwise, I would have made one of my own. But the ground is really well covered. Uh, Cornell University did a really good one, by the way. Emma did that. And uh, it just shows you how to do spore counts for Nozema. So we can see, Hive Alive is doing good at keeping spore counts down. And if they just have sugar and honey in the normal stores, do they have more Nozema? And would it be consistent over several colonies of bees? So it's just something to do counting those spores but i'm not worried that hive alive has made something so tasty to the bees that they just can't help but consume that my bigger concern is that the cluster moves too high too soon and they abandon their other resources but the bonus for this year in my opinion is that with this weird warm weather and the record setting highs uh, we're going to have more days that the bees can move freely inside the hive than they have before, and that means they excess uh, other stores that they otherwise wouldn't break cluster to go to. So when if we get days in the high 50s, low 60s inside the hive, those bees will have a loose cluster at that point, not a completely dissolved cluster because they'll still be over their brood and keeping that warm, but there'll be more bees available to move around and get those resources that otherwise are out of reach of the cluster. So. Interesting stuff. Question number three from Steve Carson. Nashville, Tennessee. When drawing honey from flow frames, what can you do if the honey is too high of a water content? So that's just not a problem for people that have flow frames, although uh, some people tend to see the cells filled with honey and they don't wait to get it capped. So always wait uh, to get them to cap with wax the, the cells of honey that they've stored because it's a pretty good indicator. And uh, But let's say you blew it. Let's say you're just so anxious, you had relatives coming, you need to show them that you had honey and you just took it off too soon. Same thing with traditional extraction. If you pulled all your frames out, pulled your honey supers off, and you found two-thirds of a frame that was uncapped. Uh, the other thing is when you find a frame like that not the flow hive types but if you find a frame that has mostly uncapped cells but you harvest it anyway because at the end of the year and you're not going to go back into the hive and you're condensing down for winter and all that stuff i have one of those grower tents those indoor grower tents that are completely closed up and they have fan conduit built into them and everything else and i'll put a link to that grower tent because this is how I tested out my daughter, by the way. I'm like, hey, I decided I have one of these interior grower things and it's for growing marijuana. 
And she was like, Dad, are you serious? I said, yeah, uh-huh. And it has heat and light and everything else, and I can grow it down there. And then she was all excited and interested, and I thought that was a tell. Why is she interested in whether or not her dad would be growing marijuana? So I said, yeah, it's for dehydrating honey. And then she was all depressed. So anyway, she's in her 30s, by the way. So I have one of those tents, which is for growers. They're inexpensive. Big frame comes, and I have a cart. And on the cart, the cart is, uh, you know, steel with all the grills on it. So what I do is you can hang frames. So if you have a frame hanger and you're going to put that in there, it's like my warming room. Because remember, this is backyard beekeeping. If you're a commercial person, this would be totally inadequate. So what I have in there is a big dehydrator, dehumidifier, and I have a cart and I put all the jars, if they're in jars, if the honey is already in jars, like it comes out of the flow hive, that's what you're going to have. And uh, I have three fans and these things have frames so the fans click on them because this is what the bees do to dehydrate the nectar and the honey that they have in the hive. They move a lot of air across it and then we dehydrate the air so we're getting a boost. Plus there's a temperature increase that automatically comes from having a dehumidifier in the space. And this thing has a bottom built into it and everything. So we're not even losing the air out of there, but it is dehumidifying. And the other thing I have in there is one of these buckets. So I have two of these sitting in the bottom of my, my inside grow thing. That takes moisture out of the air. Those things last all year, by the way. In fact, that one's not even full yet, and it was put in last year about this time. But that's how I dehydrate it, and I get 1.5% of the honey moisture down. Because the other thing is, what's the limit that you should have? We should be at 19% or lower. I know, legally, it's 20% or lower. But between 19 to 20%, you run a high risk of it possibly fermenting. So I like to go 19% or lower. And you can go 17, 5, 17, 16, 5%. And uh, that's really good honey because there's another reason that you want to dehydrate your honey down quite a bit. And once that thing's running, uh, if you have some kind of drape, some kind of area where it stays warm because the heat allows it to dissipate, it gets into the high 80s in there. And... Uh, so which makes it easy for extraction. If you're still in frames, by the way, if you have a rack that rolls in there and it's on the frames. So, because um, warmer, it'll go through filters better if you're filtering your honey or pouring or bottling or whatever you're doing. So everything works better when it's warm like that. And then you have to have a refractometer, otherwise you won't really know. Now the other thing is, um, Steve's talking about a flow hive. Because we go frame by frame, you can sit right there with a refractometer while the honey's coming out and going into your jar because it's straight from hive to jar. Uh, you can take little dips with what I use are the kebab sticks. And I just dip that, get honey on it, and then I run that right under the refractometer and it gives you something to do while you're watching the honey come out. And then you see what the percentage is. And that way you'll identify this jar because what I do for my wife is as we put the jar lids on there, I mark the percentage that it was. So if we have higher percentage moisture content, then maybe I'll just run it in there anyway. Even if I have something at 18, 9, 19%, if I'm running the system for other jars, then I go ahead and put that in. And like I said, this usually happens at the end of the year because you're pulling everything and you have a tendency to pull uh, honey that might not be right. The other thing is the lower that moisture content, the thicker the honey is, and that becomes a perception of value for people. If you're selling your honey or if you're giving it away to people, just a couple percentage points in moisture thickens that honey and people really like it. So there's a couple of things to think about there, but those grow rooms, anything that you can close in. I don't recommend uh, using your bathroom in places like that that have water resources in there because you're competing with your toilet when you're dehydrating and you know you've got open drain systems and your pee traps and things like that. So try to find a closet space or something like that if you don't want to get a you know a mobile grow room. Then uh, get something that you can drape off. And uh, another thing I did before was I had an umbrella and I put. The honey out in buckets and I clamped the umbrella to the side of a ladder and then I blew fans straight up at the umbrella plus there's a fan built in 
your dehumidifiers, which blows up. And you can't really, at least the one that I have, uh, it's one of the best ones I could find, by the way. It only blows up, so I use that exhaust fan from the dehumidifier to hit the umbrella and recycle the air down so it really blasts against the surface of your uh, honey. So it helps to hydrate that too. And I've also used a GQF incubator, one of the big cabinet style chicken egg incubators, which I realize is impractical. Most of you don't have it. That was a great uh, dehumidifier, dehumidifier as well. So the next one is question number four from Bryce. My question is, does a dark colored hive cover contribute to temperature variation that may relate to increased activity in the hive and consequently more resource use. Thanks and happy holidays from Bryce Bennett. So the hive cover, here's the thing. It depends on what kind of cover you have. Uh, if you've got the standard wooden metal clad telescoping cover that most beehives come with, uh, and if you get a lot of heat, see now, I don't know what part of the country Bryce is in. I'm not worried about that where I live, but then again, I have replaced all of my hive covers with insulated covers. And now this winter, as well as insulated covers, insulated inner covers. So the hive lid color, even if we get a super hot warm day, all that's gonna happen is the snow is gonna melt off at the top of the hive. It's really not gonna transmit or conduct heat into the hive based on that. So more um, of a concern, I guess, would be the hive color itself. So not just the lid or the cover, but uh, the hive sidewall. If you painted your hives black, there is a dramatic temperature differential. So middle of the night, 20, 23 degrees out, but you, you get a nice warm day uh, the following day. And let's say your hives are black. I know most people, almost nobody paints a beehive black. But uh, the sun will hit the southern side of that uh, hive and it will create this differential. The north side of the hive will stay cold and the south side of the hive will get the sun's full bore and it will really warm that. And if you're only using, as I do, a standard three quarter inch thick pine hive or you know, it made almost no difference thermally, by the way, if you had cedar, if you had pine, if you had paloma wood, if you had hoop pine from Australia, whatever you had, it made almost no difference as far as the conductivity of heat or cold. So uh, you don't want to paint them black. But another thing while we're talking about hives, because I realize that some people might be painting and finishing hive equipment in their basement or their garage. If you're one of those people with a heated shop or something like that, good for you, by the way. Uh, think of the colors and how visible your beehives are. So we drive, you know, I live in the country. We drive down these backcountry roads and you can see a collection of beehives that are painted white from three quarters of a mile away, way down by some riverbank somewhere out in some farmer's field. So I, I often think it might not be a great idea to advertise the location of your beehives. So one of the things I think about, I know we're on, the question was about temperature and whether or not it was affected by the sun hitting it and how that affected the bees and got them to move around more than they otherwise would be moving. But I'm on another topic since we're talking about painting and finishing hive equipment. And I like the idea of making that as nature colored as possible. So greens and tans and browns and things like that. The bees really don't need distinctive colors to home in on it. I know a lot of people do fancy pastel colors and red and everything else, but if you've got an apiary that you can't keep eyes on frequently, my apiary, I see it. I know what's going on. It has multiple cameras on it and everything else. So I'm not talking about my own equipment, but if you've got a satellite apiary somewhere, I think it's worth, um, blending that a little bit with the environment and the colors that you choose can help do that. The physical configuration shapes and things like that, uh, the bees are going to find everything just fine. So it's not so much at using these colors for your bees to orient. So I do kind of vote against white hives unless, you know, you're in a really hot area. White chickens suffer less in hot climates than darker colored chickens do. So, um, 
that's just food for thought if you're thinking about uh, painting some hives, but I don't think it's a big concern unless your cover and inner cover is uninsulated, then you would have some thermal increase there. But usually there are metal lids with that are pretty darn reflective. So I hope I answered that question. Question number five comes from Mac. Fred, I hope all is well. Wanted to check in with you on your thoughts on this question. Do magnets affect bees? And if so, is there an intensity of the magnet in which it does start to have an impact on them? Perhaps, if you have a chance, this could be a question for an upcoming Q&A. You know, as soon as somebody goes, magnets, bees, magnetism, and their response to it, uh, you might be interested to know that bees do respond to magnetic flux, by the way. And uh, a lot of testing has been done. Low-level magnetism and things like that. But I can cut you know, to the chase on that. Um, I don't know if the reason is being asked because some people like to like put magnets on the sides of their hives and things like that. If you're trying to positively influence your bees in some way with magnetic flux... Flux is a magnetic energy that flows between poles, north and south, and there's something called flux density, and there's near surface effects and everything else, and there's conductivity, and we know that there's a magnetic force that flows. That's why compasses work uh, from between the poles of the earth. So does this, can we have some impact on the bees? Well, some people actually did those studies, and they tried to get associations with bees foraging, free foraging bees, and they induced magnetic fields to see what happened. What they found was that the bees continue to prefer resources that they, that they like um, the same, but then when there were low level magnetic forces induced, the bees spent less time there and more time at an identical food resource that did not have the magnetic fields induced. The other thing was there were in the past people have asked questions about high powered lines and electromagnetic energy between the power lines and the ground and things like that. And believe it or not, there were studies and observations done there too. Uh, and so the bees would spend less time. In other words, they spent, uh, they sped themselves up when they encountered these strong magnetic fields between high power lines and the ground. So in those areas, foraging zones, because a lot of those are wild areas where all the high power lines run through the countryside. So they're mowed and then they'll, there's good, uh, what you would call hedgerow or fence row wildlife. So the honeybees did pick up the pace and move through those areas quicker. So it, it tells us that the bees can sense it somehow and uh, they do move away from it. That's all I can say because I have no context here. Mag didn't say, I wanna put magnets on my hive or some people put magnets, they glue them on the side of the hive and that's so that they can put a um, hive tool right on there on the side of the hive. Now, where's the magnetic flux contained? So if you don't have energy going from magnet to magnet, so when you have a single wafer magnet, all the magnetic flux is right there. So there's something called the near field effect of a magnet. So we can actually set a magnet down and then we can have, it's actually a pie gauge by the way, that you put ferromagnetic particles on it and then you move it close and we can find out how close uh, it has to be to get a magnetic field. And of course, this is something completely apart from beekeeping, but there are magnetic field indicators that show us how heavy and how intense a magnetic flux is. So if you don't have a flow of magnetism between magnets across the hive, then it would be for me a non-starter because the flux is right at the magnet stays at the magnet when you put this on there now you'll see a magnetic field extended into a ferromagnetic material like steel and uh, there again the field is conductive through the material so it's not like the magnetic energy just flows in random Rayleigh waves all over the place so I'd like to know more about what the context was but I think you're safe if you're worried about your bees um, reacting negatively to a magnetic flux source near the hive or on the hive. Question number six. This comes from Maryland from, let's see, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. 
My question is, if I uncap the drone brood and pluck out the larva, will the mites come out with the drone? And if not, will the baby mites left behind die or will they move into a new cell? What happens to the mother mite? By the way, that mother mite is also called the founder's mite. Will she go into a new cell? And if I do an OA treatment with the mites in the uncapped cell, will they die if they are hiding? Okay. I don't think Marilyn's going to like my answer because it's going to be oversimplified. We have a frame of drone brood, and some people use this as part of their integrated pest management for varroa destructor mites. I have lights clicking back off and on in the background. Uh, this is drone foundation. It's larger than worker foundation. It's green so that you know it's there and so that you don't forget it. So after nine days, the larvae gets capped. And so from nine days to the 24th day, that's the period that you would have varroa destructor mites inside those cells. And I say, unless we're counting mites, there's no reason to pick off uh, the drone caps and try to look for mites or to pick them off as a way of killing the mites because across the board, the most effective method to kill those mites is to just take that whole frame and put it right into your freezer, leave it overnight and take it out the following day. So 24 hours in a freezer, more than enough to kill the mites that are inside that, whether they're the reproductive mites, the founder's mites, the offspring and everything else. So I'm not really worried about the female. Now, if you didn't freeze it and all you did was uncap, then yes, that adult mite, depending on where they are in their reproduction. Remember, this is why mites don't reproduce uh, or climb into queen cells because the queen cell is not gonna be capped long enough for them to reproduce. So if we haven't hit that full reproductive cycle, we have undeveloped mites in that cell that will perish on their own because they haven't been allowed to pupate long enough. So, but just take the whole frame and freeze it. And that led me to something else, by the way. Some people are against uh, disposing of drone larvae. So they don't want to take the whole frame and just freeze it. They don't have, like, they'll, I'll say, feed it to your chickens. They say, but I don't have chickens. I don't want to just kill them all. And uh, it is interesting, not that you're going to do this, but did you know that in Denmark, they're actually looking at beekeepers who are using that as part of the integrated pest management. And they're actually looking at that uh, drone brood as a food resource. And 80 tons of drone larvae would be able to be used in the food system annually in Denmark. It's just one of those weird offshoots that I discovered while looking into things to do with drone brood. And not Denmark's not alone, but they are. there are other countries that are looking at that. But there's a whole movement of people that want to consume uh, insect protein as part of their, a meaningful part of their diet. So it's a whole other area. If you're bored and you want to look into something and go down a rabbit hole, that's it. What people are doing insects as food for people. Question number seven, Bryce Bennett from New Hampshire. Can I use quarter inch hardware cloth for a mouse guard? And will the undertaker bees be able to drag dead bees through the quarter inch mess size? Thanks. So here's my question. So if we're putting up screen hardware cloth, by the way, is just, you know, heavy duty screen. Usually it's galvanized. And people use them for mouse guards. If you notice, when you look at any of my beehives, none of them have hardware cloth style mouse guards on them. And that's why I'm going to give an alternative here to Bryce. And that's because if we're going all the way down to a quarter inch, we found out, and I have continuing observation, by the way, we've been looking at mice on beehives and at hive entrances, chewing the entrances and things like that. We have deer mice, we have meadow mice, and we have the house mouse, which is all gray, by the way. We also have the short-tailed shrew, which I did a video about recently. And none of those could enter any of my beehives if the entrance reducer was reduced down to a 3 eighths of an inch height. 
And this, by the way, is too narrow just because of the dead bee tools I want to use now. I'd have to stick this in like this and scoop the dead bees. And So now my gauge is the width of this dead bee removal tool, which is about two inches. So anyway, if you took a wooden entrance reducer, and if we're looking at quarter inch, if that's the size of the hardware screen that you want to use as your entrance reducer, why not make your entrance reducer opening a quarter inch high and two inches wide or an inch and a half wide depending on the size of the hive the population of the bees in there you satisfy uh, the limiting opening which if you had a quarter inch in height only that's lower than the 3 8 inch and it the mice would not get in i did have somebody write me and say well in northern maine or somewhere like that they have something called a pygmy shrew uh, that the pygmy shrew could get into much smaller spaces so again, I have cameras out all the time. I don't think we have the pygmy shrew in the state of Pennsylvania, but the regular mice, adult mice, are not getting in to any of the hives, even though the deer mouse can run right over the face of the hive. I'm constantly watching. So I've never had, I've had mice move into stored equipment and chew up old comb and stuff like that, but I've never had a mouse get into an occupied beehive that had a 3 8 inch or shorter opening. So my recommendation for Bryce is not to worry about going down to a quarter inch um, hardware cloth. Why not just go down to a quarter inch opening that's, you know, two inches wide, inch and a half wide, and use that. And then your bees can haul out even dead drones and things like that without any problem. Now to answer the question, could the undertaker bees which they're specialists that go around and clean up the bottom board of the hive and drag out the dead whenever they get opportunities to do that. But uh, they could get through the quarter inch. So we know a bee can make it through a quarter inch opening. But also that inhibits your ability to reach into that hive and scrape out dead bees unless the way your hardware cloth is. A lot of people screw their hardware cloth to the front of their hive. So it's pretty it's pretty fixed on there because what good would it be if you just loosely placed it on there and a mouse or something could just pull it out of the way and then go right in. So um, I think the reduced entrance, but if you have a grid on there like that, then you're also not going to be scraping out the dead bees. And I'm going to say that again, because I was amazed by how many people were not cleaning out dead bees from the bottom boards of their solid bottom board hives. Uh, in wintertime, they were just thinking the bees will do it when they do cleansing flights. So get out there every chance you get. When you go to your, I mean, just bring, these are kebab sticks. You can take these out there and scrape the bees out whenever you're going to your bee yard. Always, just as a general practice, get in there. And these only reach in so far. And that's why this came out this year, so I could reach all the way to the back. Look at the reach on this. And get as many dead bees as I can because every dead bee that I pull out of the bottom of that hive gets moisture out of the hive at the bottom board, tears away and removes uh, decaying animal material, which if you know, if you've ever opened up a hive that was a dead out, usually it's a dead out, uh, a pile of dead bees just really stinks. And you have to wonder if I'd been cleaning that up, would I have helped the bees that remain? Because then they wouldn't be exposed to all that additional moisture, the detritus of decaying bees and things like that. So clean out as much of your bottom boards as you can every time you go to your apiary and of course as the person asked in the beginning of today's q a pay attention to those landing boards and see what's going on and see if the bees are hauling things out but i see hardware cloth anymore as non-essential as a mouse guard unless you've got some kind of tiny mammal that can really get in there and uh, i see no evidence of it yet they can get in under a 3 eighths, but if you're dropping that down to even a quarter inch, your bees will come and go through that freely, and uh, the ground's covered. Mice won't get in. So, question number eight from Brenda in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Let's see, is there any study going on for adding a chemical compound in bees' food, like in a pollen patty? that beekeepers can feed that will be safe for bees, but stores in the bee liver, where the mite just starts feeding, it will die. So that's interesting. Um, there isn't right now. 
And I understand because that seems like a perfect world, since the adult Varroa destructor mite feeds on the fat body stores, which uh, Dr. Ramsey refers to as the bee's liver, the fats. Uh, and if they were to bite into that, and if that bee had something that was, here's the trick, and this is why this is so hard for biochemists to do. Uh, to have a chemical that would be systemically employed by the bee that could kill a varroa destructor mite, but not negatively impact the overall health and well-being of the bee. That's the challenge, and right now I don't know of anything that can do that. So, that's a no, but I understand why people would want something like that to exist, because it makes sense if you could feed something. It's just like we give wormers and medications to our pets, you know, so the dog, flea and tick, you know, medication that if a flea bites it, the flea dies and things like that. It would be great if we had something, but now see, with a flea and a tick situation, we've got a mammal and then we've got the insect world going on there. So, and I know somebody's going to say something about ticks or ticks might be arachnids or I don't know, because the Varroa destructor mite is an arachnid, so who knows? But anyway, when we're mixing species, but if we have insects and pesticides relevant to insects, then we have a miticide that we want the insect to carry that could be detrimental. It just creates huge challenges, I think. But right now, I don't know of anything. If somebody else knows of a study ongoing that's yet to be published, for example, again, please put that down in the comments section. I would love to read more about it, because on the face of it, it would be cool. And uh, here, Eric submits this question. I do have another question for you about Bettercum. For those of you who don't know, Bettercum is a synthetic uh, beeswax comb, Bio biochemically very similar to actual beeswax. It's just man-made. So a question for you about Bettercum. I commented on one of your articles a couple of days ago about the wire sagging. I will be purchasing a 10-frame flow hive. And I have a question about checkerboarding for a myriad of reasons. I'm going to get a box of bees, not a feral swarm, nor a nuke. Now, finally to my question, should I fill the whole brood box with 10 frames of better comb, or should I leave a few foundationless frames in between the better comb so they can build some comb on their own? And so on. So, yeah, I never take a whole... 10 frame box or an 8 frame box of deep. Better comb comes in deep and medium. And uh, But what I do is because better comb, because the cells are already there, it's a rapid start. Uh, especially for those who do not have any drawn out foundation. That's why it's critical. So it can get things going really fast. And this is an established, it looks like an established hive that you're getting. I don't put more than two or three better comb frames in there. And then the next frame outside of the better comb is a foundationless frame. And then after the foundationless frame, I might put a full heavy wax plastic frame. So better comb, foundationless. And for those of you who don't know, foundationless is a wooden frame that some people have starter strips. They put wax on it. I don't. I just let, I push them all together and the bees naturally build on the foundationless comb. And you can see it in uh, my video on the long Langstroth hive where I do a full inspection. I show you the better comb because it's marked on the back of the frame. Better comb. And then the next one will just be a wooden frame with no marking on it. And we can see the foundationless frame where the bees make everything themselves. And then the better comb, which is, of course, they finish the edges of it. And then they finish working the frame and the comb. But on the natural foundationless frames the bees draw it all the way down to the bottom but they never quite connect completely to the bottom of the frame so they always leave this little passageway along the bottom in foundationless comb which is pretty interesting to me but i would be really sparing with that and then of course foundation or better comb foundationless and so on i never put two foundationless frames together and this is where i also want to mention it is critical for you when you're setting up your first hives that side to side, your hive be absolutely level, absolutely plumb. And that's because bees build to gravity. So if your hives are tilted to the sides, tilting fore and aft in parallel with the axis of your frames is not a big deal. 
tipping side to side is because now the bees tend to cross comb and bridge comb and things like that. The other thing is some people like to space out their, their frames and like take a 10 frame box and put nine frames in it and then they space everything out. When your comb is brand new and they haven't drawn the foundation yet, I encourage you not to spread out your frames like that. Push them all together as close as you can because then the bees are less likely to bridge comb and cross comb and things like that. When you spread it out and you eliminate one of the frames to get deeper cells, which some people like to do, uh, then you run the risk of more wonky comb, comb that the, they just free form it. So I've had really good luck with this checkerboarding that you've described here. And I saved the better comb as emergency. That's the high quality, it's expensive. And I keep that uh, just for startups, swarm collection, things like that. And I use it spread no more than two or three in a box. Ta-da! But if you were committed and you absolutely wanted to use better comb and, and you want to use as much of it as you can, then yes, every other frame would be your foundationless. So if you wanted to keep plastic completely out of your hive, then it would be better comb, foundationless, better comb, foundationless, all the way across. And it makes no difference if your first frame is foundationless or if your first frame, for example, is better comb. I find here where I live that the bees tend to work more towards the eastern side of the hive. So if your landing board is facing south, then they tend to start on that east side and work to the west and to the middle of the hive after that. Question number 10. See, we're already here today. This is from uh, Mike. Could you speak more of drone congregation areas? I'm in Oregon and we are now very wet after a really hot summer. We had two days of 116 degrees, major records. Wow, I never thought of Oregon as having 116 degree weather. That is really hot. Uh, this summer, right then, blackberries were going to bloom. Bees made it through that with very little help. Amazing species. Well, just drone congregation areas, for people that don't know, and a lot of study has been done on drone congregation areas. First of all, the drones, for those who don't know, those are the male bees. They are the reproductive uh, material for the colony. Drones fly out and they mate with queens, virgin queens, from other colonies, not the colony that they've emitted from. And then the big mystery, uh, you know, that people always like to talk about, how did the queen, when she's a virgin, and she hatched out of that hive, and then she matures after hatching out, and then she goes on her mating flight after the first week, and people like to put these very specific timelines on when all of these things happen. And I've had queens do very surprising things at a very young age and so on. But then she flies out and there's a, grown, a drone congregation area that she finds miraculously. She's never seen the terrain or anything else. But the queen flies high and uh, to adjacent valleys and low levels and things like that. And then people track down drone congregation areas. And these are drones from all around. Drones use a lot of fuel in a very short amount of time. They are heavy bodied, they're noisy, that's why they're called drones. If you've ever been sitting, staring at your landing board, and a noisy bee comes in, you think, oh, either a bee is angry or it's a drone coming in. And the drones make a lot of noise. So they have a very limited flight time, by the way. So the farther away the drone congregation area is, the more resources that drone bee uses to get there. Then it has a very limited amount of time, usually about 10 minutes, to hunt for a virgin queen. So look at the logistics of this. The drone is hoping to arrive at just the perfect time when the virgin queen shows up, and then he hopes to be one of the few that gets a chance to mate with the virgin queen. And then the Speculation about how high off the ground, how high up are these drone congregation areas? Well, they can be 20, 30, 40 feet up. And then there are low valley areas. They get utilized year after year as a drone congregation area. And then there's the fakery. There's the biologists that get up there and they create a fake queen or they put a queen in a cage and they put that queen aloft on a balloon or something. And then they see if drones congregate, where the queen is and then they run it in a big loop and they make these observations about the drones and how fast they fly and they form something called 
a comet, a comet of drones. And then how many drones are in that? And this varies by species of honeybee. But we're talking about Apis mellifera. There might be 31 drones on average. And then they looked at how much time they spend in the congregation comet. So when they're actively pursuing the queen, they have this ability to accelerate. So they even measured the acceleration rate of drones trying to mate with virgin queen honeybees. So this is knowledge for the sake of knowledge, uh, for me, you know, if we're not queen breeders, we're not worried about, you know, how far away the queen has to fly to engage with new stock or to preserve the integrity of her own genetics and things like that. And now we set out our own drone out yards. So then we have beehives that do nothing but generate drones. And so those with high drone numbers in them are put in the out yards and we're thinking that the queen will fly in that direction. So drone congregation areas are just random areas as far as we know where uh, drones tend to go time and time again. And not only that, virgin queens from different apiaries around tend to just instinctively find these places. So is it the geography? They tend to be like there's a hilly area and then there's a descending mountainside to the south and that'll be a congregation area, river valleys and things like that adjacent to Piedmont areas and stuff like that. So there's no hard and fast... Uh, rule as far as where a drone congregation could be, only that when you find them, how do you know you're in an active drone congregation area? Excuse the humor, but it'll be filled with dead drones on the ground with little smiles on their faces, and uh, because after they mate, they die. So, that's about as much as I can do, but I do know this. Before I do walk away splits and start dividing my colonies, which is coming up in spring, and I'm going to talk about this at an upcoming beekeeper meeting, and I can't wait because it's a lot of fun to talk about. The uh, I look to see that there are a number of drones coming and going from several different colonies of bees. And then when I see that they're producing drones, drone numbers are out, I make the assumption then that other apiaries in the area more distant from mine, where my virgin queens might fly to, would also be producing drones. Which drones do I want to come after my queen? This is why I want to do my splits earlier before people get a chance to install new packages and stock that they've brought up from the south and things like that. I would like to do my splits early because number one, swarms are going to happen early if I don't split my colonies and or expand them and try to do everything I can to mitigate swarming. Uh, I want to do that when I start to see lots of drones around because I want my queens to go out and mate with drones that are already in the area, locally adapted, survived winter. If I do that midsummer, now we've brought in potentially uh, bee stock from all over the place that could have come in by packages in the mail and brought up as, you know, nucleus colonies from the south and things like that. And so then I don't have locally adapted genetics to go with my brand new virgin queens. So I hope that helps out. And that was the end of today. So now we have the fluff, by the way. Stuff we wanted to talk about because uh, one of my favorite publications is the American Bee Journal. And the December issue is out. The January issue is out. But I, I wanted to hit on a couple of things. These are lies that have been told to beekeepers. And I'm lucky that I've never really fallen for this myself. You've never heard me say things like, uh, let's see, if honeybees died, humanity dies in four years. Yeah, I, think it's, I think they say specifically bees, not just honeybees, so all bee species. So is it true if honeybees died or bees in general, all species of bees die, does humankind die and are we eliminated from the face of the earth in four years? No. That is a very sensational statement. So I've never said it. I don't recycle that information because it didn't sound right to me. It just didn't make sense. There are other things that, uh, there's wind pollinated plants and everything else, but without getting into the nitty gritty details, I'm, I'm telling you this because often new beekeepers recycle this information. And another one was, um, 
two out of three bites. Let's see. Honeybees is old. One out of every three bites we take comes from bee pollination. And I'm going to give you a link to a study on that. But a lot of people like to give presentations. I give a lot of presentations to elementary school kids. Those are sensational things that we tell kids. If I say one of every three bites you take is because of a bee. Well, again, I don't say that to people and I don't start things that way. And it got me thinking. So I have an article that I'm going to link down in the video description that I hope that you'll read because it kind of steps on some of these fallacies that we have going on. Now, so I never recycle that one either. You'll never hear me start out and think, did you know that everything that you're eating, most of it is dependent upon pollinators? Now, there's no, there's no doubt that pollination, that bees of all kinds and pollinators of all kinds contribute greatly to our food diversity, right? Plant diversity. We wouldn't have flowers without them. So they make a massive contribution, but it's these sensational statements that can damage your credibility as uh, someone who knows about bees and wants to share about them. And here's the one that I'm guilty of. Here's the one that I bombed because I took it as gospel. When people say, how long is honey good for? And how many times have I said, Oh man, honey, they found that stuff in the pyramids. I'm pretty sure Tutankhamun uh, had it and uh, they found jars of it. And it was not only did they find it in the pyramids, still good, still healthy, just as good as the day that it was put in the jar. We say things like that. Now, maybe I didn't embellish it that much, but he did say it has an indefinite shelf life. They found it in the pyramids. Now, how many have you been told that? I've been told that. And so here we go, another Cornell man, by the way, wrote this article. This is Peter L. Borst, and it made the cover. Did it make the cover? Yeah. Is honey from the pyramids still good? And this is the American Bee Journal, December of 2021. So this is hot off the press. We're still in December right now. We go to page 1305, and they talk about... This article, The Honey Jar. And it's very interesting how this kind of legend or, you know, this misinformation has been passed on through the years to all these beekeepers and turns out not even to be true, not even close. Do you know what they did find in one jar? I'm going to show it to you here. They found residue of what they thought must have been honey and a little bit of outline of honeycomb on this pot and that was it if honey existed in that environment it would be reduced to a little a little residue it wouldn't have been still in jar good as ever probably crystallized but still 100 percent nutritional just like regular honey think about it so I want you, because you watch me, I want you to know stuff. I want you to have the knowledge that you don't get duped when somebody says that. Now, it doesn't mean that we call people out and go, yeah, it shows what you know. Well, you know, the, that honey in the pyramids was a lie. Don't use it to beat people up, but use it to inform your friends and be the source of great information. So those are some myths that I wanted to kind of dismantle for you. And I also highly recommend, if you don't already get the Bee Journal and uh, things like that. There's always great articles in there. Food, pollination, all that stuff. Interesting, good to know for the sake of knowing. But try to avoid sensational statements about overly glorifying the contribution of pollinators because their contribution is significant enough. It is fantastic. It's amazing what bees of all species do. And uh, I want you to know the right things so that you can say the right things so that you don't ever get called out. And I hope I don't get called out on the, the false information I put out there about honey lasting forever. For all purposes, you know, the honey that you sell to somebody, 
I tell people things like this. Same thing with my photography. I say, oh, this picture has a fade rating of 105 years. So six years from now, it starts fading out. Bring it back. I'll give you another one. Same thing with the honey. If, you know, you know, 110 years from now, that honey goes off, uh, just bring it back. I'll give you another one. So the other thing is honey does change over time in the jar, no matter how great your jar is, no matter how fantastic your processing was, and hopefully you're giving people raw honey. If you're a backyard beekeeper, there's value in honey that actually smells like it came from the country. It better not smell like everything you buy from the grocery store. So it does age over time, it does get darker over time, and it does change its flavor over time, but then it ultimately will stabilize. So I would recommend telling people 105 years, if you don't like the taste of it, I will give you a free jar when you come. So thanks for watching me today. Thanks for being here. If you want to talk to people because you're bored, still sitting at home, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, during the holidays, go to the Facebook group, the way to be. And you can talk to people day or night, 24 seven, all over the world and talk about what you're doing with bees or just eavesdrop. Just get in there and peek in and see what other people are doing and sharing about. It's a great group and I hope you'll join. So thanks for being here and I hope you have a fantastic Christmas and enjoy your holiday break.